What's up, traders? Anthony Cardelli here, and thank you for tuning in to the Futures Radio Show podcast. Hope you guys are ready for a big show today because my guests are Danielle DiMartino Booth and Tracy Shuchart, otherwise known as Shy Girl. Two of my most popular guests on the podcast over the years, and it was great having the two of them on the same show today. All I could tell you is have a pen and paper ready because I know I took a bunch of notes, and we talked about so many important things pertaining to today's markets. We talked about inflation and how to go about trading certain markets if you think inflation is coming, like I do. Talked about gold, the dollar, crude oil, a lot of NASDAQ talk today. Touch base on crypto and central bank digital currencies, which I think you're going to really enjoy hearing the perspective from Tracy and Danielle on this. We even talked a little bit about real estate. Like I said, pretty much everything pertaining to today's markets. Futures Radio Show is sponsored by CME Group. They are the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world effectively manage risk. For access to free educational tools and resources for the active individual trader, please visit activetrader.cmegroup.com. Remember, everybody, you can listen to Futures Radio Show podcast anywhere where podcasts are available, Spotify, Stitcher, iTunes. But if you want to watch Futures Radio Show, you can check us out on YouTube or on my website, anthonycrudelli.com. Futures Radio Show is also sponsored by Trading Technologies, TradeStation, and FTSE Russell. The Russell 2000 is a key benchmark for small cap U.S. stocks. Be sure to check out the E-mini Russell 2000 future symbol RTY and micro E-mini Russell 2000 future symbol M2K. To learn more about FTSE Russell and their products, please visit FTSERussell.com. Danielle, Tracy, thank you guys so much for joining me today. Great to be here. This is the first time we've been together, me and Tracy, for gosh, I don't know, two years, right? Quite a while. Yeah, it's been a while. Has it been that long? As I remember watching something with the two of you, I just think you guys are great. And definitely two of the people that I respect uh, a lot and what you guys think about markets. And today we're just going to jump right into it. I mean, the, the big thing that everybody is talking about is inflation. Danielle, I'm going to come to you first. I mean, what do you see happening? Is inflation uh, coming in a big way? Or just talk to us about what you think. I think a lot of the inflation that is coming at us in a big way is actually already in the rearview mirror, at least on the good side of the equation. Uh, you have to think that a, a year ago, markets were bottom, literally bottoming today. And, um, and the entire global supply chain was completely disrupted and you couldn't get goods out of China. So th that was a huge source of building up, pent up inflation that was going to really disrupt the supply chain. We've seen the major thrust of that, of that destruction come and go. And now you have a bunch of Chinese suppliers that have been pushed out of the way by higher cost U.S. suppliers, and they're keen to get their market share back. And the entire country's back up and running the situation at the ports is totally clogged up right now, but it's becoming slowly unclogged. So I think what people are not realizing is that the original source of this inflation scare is beginning to dissipate. It's going to be hard to see, though, because we've got services inflation coming online, whether you're talking about airlines, hotels, any kind of travel related uh, stocks. Americans have pent up demand for travel. They've got fresh stimulus checks in their hand. There, It's going to be a huge spring break going into the summer. So you will see services inflation pick up as well, but it's not going to be, it's not going to prove to be as long lasting as what a lot of the people who are a lot very freaked out right now are suggesting. So you said the, the, the good is in the rear view mirror. So you're saying that the, the bad is what's coming next. Is that what you're no, goods, goods inflation, goods, oh, hard, goods. I'm, I'm talking about in input costs, you know, what you hear from the ISM being at the highest level in, in a decade and what have you. I mean, these, these are very real margin squeeze sources for companies, but a lot of the worst of that goods inflation, input inflation, you saw iron ore start to come down. You've seen copper start to roll over. Uh, you're not seeing it on the grains, which I'm going to let Tracy talk to. Uh, but, but a lot, I think of what we, we're going to see hit the cyclical sector, hit the factory data. I think some of that's in the rearview mirror at this point. Trace. Yes. 
Uh, what do you think about that? I mean, we hear what Danielle thinks about it with the goods. Where are you? Uh, wh- what are you seeing? With so inflation? no, I definitely, I do definitely agree with that. I think we're going to see inflation in certain sectors, right? That it's going to. Um, again with like the grains right so i think food inflation is a real thing and it's going to continue to be a real thing um and that's why you know if we look at the grains markets today it was basically the only market that that held up so i think we're going to continue to see inflation um in different aspects i think the rest of the market kind of was re is reacting to this uh bounce in bonds today yeah, no, no, no doubt about that. And and go uh, and this is where I'm going to address both of you. And I think, you know, thinking about inflation and how we trade this, because it's a trader. Obviously, everybody listening to this is this is a trader show. You know, how we trade it, and obviously the grains they have taken off. Um, but there's there's some things that have done really well. That's and there's a lot of things that that I thought would do well in an inflationary scenario that have not. Um, uh, stay, Trace, we'll stay with you first. I mean, we we know that grains obviously right now have been doing well. Do you think they're going to continue to be well? Is that going to be the focus? Where is the next trade? Where are the markets that you'd be focusing on if we're going to con- see this inflation play continue? Well, I continue. I, I mean, I continue. I, I'm still big on agriculture in general, um, fertilizers, anything agriculture related, farm equipment, et cetera. Um, grains. I think that that is going to be a long term if I'm looking long term. So it's under my long term investment category, uh, because I think that is going to uh, continue, um, especially in light of um, climate change and uh, ASF and all these other things that we're seeing that's happening in the food market, you know, population is growing, things like that. So I, I definitely think that I'm still looking for that category for a longer term trade. So you so, that's you're staying with that. So I'm you, staying with that one. Yes. Got it. Um, and you know, with oil, I'm staying with oil as well. I mean, we got a huge pullback. I realized, but it was. I think oil got very much ahead of itself, right? Um, and I'm kind of welcome that pullback again. I think this move. This quick move up in the bond market, everybody was short. This might be fast and furious, right? Everyone was short in the bond market. Bonds are starting to bounce some, and that's causing people to have to take off some of those inflation hedges, which oil was used for an inflation hedge. Um, so we're seeing a big pullback in oil because of this. Danielle, but over were- the long term, I'm still bullish. You know, over the next year, two years, I'm still bullish uh, oil just because of all the things we talked about before, lack of CapEx um, and, and things of that nature. Oil and grains. Danielle, you were going to say something. I saw you. So uh, d- just to back up what Tracy's saying, so there's obviously a huge cluster on the open seas in terms of uh, available containers. So you've got sugar that's piled up in India. You've got coffee that's piled up in Vietnam. Uh, and you have for the first time a broad reopening of the United States economy of nicer restaurants and people are ready to quit going to the drive through for dinner. They're ready to go sit down at a restaurant. I know you're in Florida, I'm in Texas where a lot of the country has been open for a very long time, but there's a lot of pent up demand for higher end restaurants. And that's the one area in the consumer price index that has been totally lagging. So we've seen it in fast foods, we've seen it in mid market, we've seen it in grocery aisles, but we have yet to see it in fine dining. And that I think is where you're going to see truly sustained demand for a lot of the grains that are in Tracy's wheelhouse that she's speaking to. So I do think that this is going to be something that's going to carry itself when you start to see some of the rebar, steel, copper, iron ore, trades roll over, you're going you're gonna to have an entire complex to fall back on. And again, this is not my wheelhouse, it's Tracy's, but I'm just telling you what the CPI is already exhibiting. I want to stay then on the CPI just for a second, because a lot of people really beat up the CPI and they say that, that that's not even really a good uh, calculation for true inflation. What do you think, Danielle? You know, it depends. Uh, it underreports the most important aspects of inflation so that you know that i can see how that gets under your skin it underreports healthcare and underreports housing but if you're getting granular inside the cpi it's a great place to look for trends and it's a great place to look for 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 things that are backing down and for things that you have when you look at what's happened in used cars for example 
I mean, it's just been in fuego. And that's been indicative of, again, a lot of these supply chain disruptions. And that's where you saw a lot of the demand come out with this massive trade with people moving into the exurbs, into ex-Serbia. And they got out there and they were like, well, hell, I guess I need some wheels now that I can't get anywhere. So it was kind of a follow on effect to this massive move away from city centers. Uh, but you have to look and say to yourself, is that trade long in the tooth? Well, inflation statistics, also the Mannheim index, uh, there are some great places to see whether there's an overheating and a topping out going. But um, in terms of the broad CPI index, it gets speed up and it gets speed up for good reason. And by the way, the Federal Reserve excludes food and energy, which is, you know, by the time you get to healthcare and, and home ownership being underrepresented and the Fed knocking out food and energy, it's kind of an irrelevant aggregate metric. But if you want to get down and dirty, which we do at Quill Intelligence, it can be a great, it can be a great treasure trove of information. One thing I'll say is that the Fed's looking at it. So whether I think it's a good or bad, <laughs> you know, uh, how they set we're, policy. That's what it is. So you, you have to keep an eye on it because I see a lot of people always bashing it. I'm going, well, I mean, this is not my wheelhouse, but the Fed's looking at it. So obviously it's something that I need to keep a look at. Trace, I don't know if you want to comment on what you think about CPI at all. Yeah, no, I mean, nothing that hasn't already been said. So, Danielle, I want to just stay with you just for a second, because as I uh, botched it earlier and I thought goods versus goods, uh, good versus goods, the, the, I, I think what I was thinking in my mind is there some inflation is good. And I was thinking, is some of the good inflation already behind us? And in my mind, I was thinking that a little bit, maybe got ahead of myself. But when we talk with Tracy, Tracy said how she thinks the grains and oil, that's really where she sees the trade going forward if you're in the camp that the inflation is going to continue to stay long to long term longer term but yeah but I, exactly I mean, we're, we're talking more macro here i get it um i mean i got long oil today um so I, i'm with you there i've been waiting for a pullback <laughs> and i'm sweating it but um so danielle what 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 do you see is where would you be focusing as a trader out there to or an investor to to play the inflation going forward well, now we do get to the good and the bad, right? Because you're talking about the two most visible things to a household. So you're talking yes. about sustained increases in food prices, sustained increases at prices at the pump, which is very visible. I mean, you know, you've seen what you've seen in 70, 80 cent rise per gallon. Uh, that's visible and it's not welcome. On top of that, people are going to start traveling. So there's going to be crazy demand and you'll see a bounce in the hotel stocks, for example. Airline stocks to me right now are <laughs> interesting. Let's put it that way. I mean, American Airlines got $50 billion of debt on its balance sheet. Woohoo, it's near an all time high. I, I don't get that to begin with. And you, you know, you, the United States is not an island. And I think that, that people have to understand that Europe is still a train wreck when it comes to the coronavirus and that oil is, you know, by far a very global market. So what's happening in the United States is not occurring in a vacuum, but I can tell you that this spring break is going to be balls to the wall nuts in terms of gasoline consumption, hotels, because people knew the stimulus money was coming even before it got there, once it was signed into law. So they, they put it on the credit card. So you're going to see services inflation picking up and there will be ways to play that scare, especially because if you look at March, April, May of 2020, what the, the central bankers keep talking about is base effects. I mean, for nimble traders, people who want to get in and out of, of, of interest rate trading, your base effect come May when the CPI year over year, May 2020, was printed at 0.1%. I mean, whether the inflation is going to be sustained or not, there's certainly going to be some scare moments in the markets when these numbers are reported that should get Jay Powell's attention, even if he's looking through them and saying this is transient and I'm going to look past this. Markets, markets trade on psychology and great big headline prints are going to get the attention of investors. Trace, I want to go back to you. Uh, you know, I talked to you a few months ago on the show. You were focusing on energy stocks. Remember, we had kind of had a laugh about this. Yeah, you and I, are... I mean, I'm still, I still am. I know. And we're, you know, we're old school futures traders. And I talked uh, about how I liked gold and and you said i think gold's gonna probably simmer here for a little bit you're right i, I give it to you you know I, i've been getting my butt beat up on gold and i hear the both of you talk about how to trade this inflation nobody's saying gold nobody's saying silver i'm not even hearing crypto i mean so trace why is gold or silver why are they not in your place 
you know, I mean, I think that I think gold is stuck right now. And I know there's a lot of theories out there. People are going to Bitcoin instead of gold. I'm not even sure that 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 that's it. Right. Because I think gold is, uh, you know, a reflection more of of rates. Right. And um, I mean, um, you know, bonds haven't really bounced. Right. So gold's not really going to bounce. Now we're starting to see some of a bounce, but then on the other side of the equation, now you have the dollar bouncing a little bit. So um, gold's got this push pull and it's not really able to break out to, to either side. So is it, is it the, is it the technicals? Um, is it just, is the, is the gold trade done? Uh, are, are, meaning that are you waiting for some technicals to firm up? Are you waiting for the bonds to, to bounce? Then it becomes more of a factor. Is it a combination of the of the reasons? We'll see. I I mean I think I mean I would th either gold has to take a dive, and I would you know if we hit you know like which I don't think that we will. But if you know it really took a dive, then I would get in there and start buying it. Um, or you have to wait till it breaks out, right? You're going to have to wait till it breaks out or like over 1850, at least. I mean, we're s literally, it's stuck in a range right here. Um, you know, obviously having gold in your portfolio or something like that, it's totally different. But if you're looking to literally just trade it, I don't really see a trade here right now, to be honest. And Danielle, I'll go back to you, but doesn't it surprise you a little bit that gold is getting slapped around the way that it, that it is? Um, you know, silver and gold both have done well, but they've come off lately. I know that we're going to talk about bonds and how they've downticked, no doubt. But when you talk about all the speculation you see in the grains, oil, uh, you know, crypto, it, it, the gold and silver got love for a little bit and it is just gone now. And I, I know it because it's taken for me um because i keep buying the dips on it but i mean i just want to hear your thoughts on it thing yo yeah I, i'm right there with you my gold is in a fetal position too so <laughs> I, i'm holding on to it and it is no fun none no. at all uh, uh but on the other hand you know i'm not i'm not i'm but by the same token i'm not getting rid of it when you see the s packs when you see the dogecoin when you see the ipos of companies with no profits when you see all of these hallmarks and retail trading north of a fifth of volume uh, gold outperforms in times of inflation and market disruption. And right now, everybody's bought into the fact that the Fed is going to be there no matter what dot, dot, dot. I, I, I mean, I get that. I understand it. And, and the fiscal machine's running in the background. And they say that the 1.9 trillion is going to be followed by another three to four trillion with reconciliation, by the way, just the 50 votes. So we know that there's going to be more money pumped into the economy, but the the magnitude of the short trade in treasury, especially long dated, the magnitude of the short trade in the dollar, I, these, were, the, these were trades that were so, so sprung tight that they were ready to be released. I mean, it was almost, you, you could see the dollar narrative coming because everybody had trashed it. The dollar was dead. That's how 2020 ended. And everybody was piled into the short dollar position. So something had to give. What gave was Europe hunkered back down and shut back down. And that's, you know, whatever, it's a third of the world economy, basically. Uh, and, and so the thing that I follow the most closely, actually, is the yuan. I follow that every single night because that were, that's where the real interplay has been. The real tension has been, has been to me between China and the United States. And it's played out quietly in the currency market. And you've watched the yuan appreciate very steadily while the dollar depreciated. So it's that relationship I'm looking to break before you start to see fallout in other asset classes. Got it. And, you know, just hearing from the both of you when I, and just to stay on gold for a second uh, is, is really to me, it's, it's, it matters. It just doesn't matter right now. And there's some things that are hurting it. Um, but I, it's like, I go back to kind of you with you, Trace, and what you had said is that when the technicals start to show up on it, and this is the one thing I've learned about trading gold is that it, it's, it's a very one way market for periods of time. It just goes up and then it goes up way more than you think. And then when it goes down, it's going down more than you think. And it's one of those things where if you're trying to just pick, pick that dip perfectly, 
it's difficult and then all of a sudden it'll start working and it's going to be hard to buy it and that's when we got to do it and that's kind of trader talking here but there, well, there's a bunch of things we're going to we're going to continue to talk about i'm going to take a break for 30 seconds and when we come back i want to talk about that dollar i want to talk about um cbdc and get into a little bit more crypto so hang tight traders we'll be back in 30 seconds get s p 500 and nasdaq 100 by the slice just one tenth of the pie trade the tastiest index futures micro e-mini options with trade station get a piece of the pie now trade the global markets with trading technologies tt is the world's fastest commercially available futures trading platform now with integrated tools for advanced options trading cryptocurrencies and trade surveillance learn more at try tt now Dot com. Welcome back, traders. Uh, I'm going to go to Tracy here first. Uh, Tracy, you're actually the one who really let me know about the CBDC. I think you were one of the first people I see to, uh, saw to tweet about this. You came on the show. We talked about this. I know you just put out a tweet the other day that uh, Danielle uh, retweeted, so you guys can go and check out that on either one of their streams. What's going on here with this CBDC, Central Bank Digital Currency, for those of you that don't know what that is? Well, well, first, it looks like it's coming. Uh, China today just announced that six major banks, the six major state-owned banks, I should say, um, are starting to market this to the public. So it's rolling out, and it's, you know, we always knew that it was coming from China first. I think every, the world's kind of watching to see how it turns out from with them, but they're definitely rolling it out. Um, you know, Europe has their plans. Uh, the U.S. has their plans. However, Jay Powell did say the other day that we would have cash alongside of CBDC, um, which is something that the other central banks haven't have not said. Um, so, you know, that should be interesting. And I still think that you know, I still think the U.S. is going to watch other mar other markets first. Um, before they dive head first into this, you know, we do have the world's reserve currency. So um, I think they're very aware of that and, um, you know, kind of are going to be a little more uh, conservative in um, jumping right in. Right. What is the implications of this, though? Uh, I mean, what is the it, going back to the trader and the investor side? This starts to happen. I mean, what do you see? How do how do we? I mean, th there's a play here. <laughs> um, well, I you know, it's, it's, you're going to see it in the it, obviously in the in the FX markets, right? Um, yeah. And you probably see it everywhere. I mean, I, I kind of think we, we really need to see where this is going and how are they going to use this? Are they going to cut out commercial banks? Um, are they, you know, we really don't really have enough information right now to ascertain the proper trade to take at this moment. Danielle, we're going to go back to you because look at you, you know, the inside of what they're probably thinking better than anybody because you've been in these rooms and, and what do you think they're talking about or thinking about with this uh, CBDC? Well, I mean, I, I think the Fed does not like the position that it's being put in. Uh, you know, there's there's chatter right now about boycotting the Beijing Olympics. And China came out and said that, you know, if you want to spend money in China, you might have to use their digital currency, no matter where you're from. That alone would be reason enough for, for the United States to boycott the Olympics. It's that serious because they don't want anybody monitoring Americans' transactional flows. And... And the play here in terms of looking at it from an investor perspective is if you have full on adoption of a CBDC, Fed coin, whatever you want to call it, you're negating the need to have a commercial banking system. So the, exactly. the banking lobby in America is really busy on Capitol Hill saying, we understand this is a matter of national security. China cannot be the only major economy with a CBDC. We get that we're going to have to adopt one as well, but that's why you hear Jay Powell, who's a pragmatist and who's not a PhD and who's a former investment banker, say that cash would be rolled out alongside of a CBDC. The one potential change element is a, a gal by the name of Janet Yellen. And you know she's a UC Berkeley educated labor economist who continues to think and say that all of the stimulus money is going to trickle down to the people who need it the most. And yet the people who need it the most are being paid so much they don't want to come back into the workforce. I paraphrase. But if you want to find a way to get money directly to 
the individual and not rely on trickle down economics, which is broken, then you open up an account at the Federal Reserve and you give it directly to them. Now that's against the law. And that's what most people need to understand right now is the Federal Reserve Act of 1913 prohibits Fed Federal Reserve liabilities from being legal tender. So right now there has to be a middleman in the form of the commercial banking system. So th there are a lot of intricacies. This is something that we could talk about for hours on end, but the pushback that you see from Jay Powell whose term ends at the end of January and who might be supplanted by somebody more amenable to all this chatter of CBDC, that is where the tension lies. And it's because of, again, you, neg you, you negate, you render irrelevant depository institutions. Why, why take deposits if everybody's got their deposits at the Fed and or during times of disruption? They want their money at the Federal Reserve in their individual non-financial account. So very political, very damaging to, to, to major banks is the bottom line. But again, we cannot let China forge down this path solo. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that totally. I mean, that's really what I was thinking. I mean, if you're one of these commercial banks right now, this is you're sweating. I mean, and so Danielle, let's just say this gets launched. What what do the markets do? What, what's what do you think the initial reaction in and I don't know, pick a market like any markets where you think actually would be the most sensitive if this gets implemented? Well, Anthony, I, I think I, I think we're getting over our skis here just in pondering that question, because something like this is not going to be launched in the United States unless there's some kind of a crisis, unless there's a moment. Mean, it's not like willy nilly. You walk up to the hill one day and you say, let's reopen the Federal Reserve Act of 1913. I mean, yeah. that's something you do under duress as a Congress. And so it, whatever happens in, 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 in financial markets in terms of the level of distress that would prompt something, a, a, an act of this magnitude, we'd have much bigger problems on our hands if this was to come to play. Because again, this is the United States of America. You can't, th this is, it requires an act of Congress. It requires a law change. And, you know, politicians don't like to do anything unless something's broken. Fair point. And I, I guess I just look at it like this. Once something like that starts to happen, I know that it won't happen here first. Tracy said that the, the, the U.S. would be very careful in watching this and very patient. I just wonder if this just doesn't open up the doors. And I'm just wondering what I would think, well, how some markets would react if something like this does happen. Tracy, we'll go back to you. Same question I asked Danielle. What, what do you think? Well, I, exactly. I mean, I have to say that you're looking, I don't... I just don't think we have enough information right now, uh, honestly, because we don't know uh, what China's gonna look like. We don't know what Europe is gonna look like. We don't know what uh, CBDC plus a cash rollout in the United States would look like. Um, you know, I think that what you wanna do is you wanna be watching that, those markets so that if it does happen here, then you kind of have an idea of what's happening. And that's again, why I think that that the U.S. is being slow on the roll with this. They want to see what happens in other markets as well. And, you know, if it turns out to be, you know, horrible, right, they're going to alter it, change it, or, uh, you know, just not even do it. So, again, if you want to know what to look for, look, look, I'd say watch those other markets and see what's happening in those other markets as soon as they start rolling it out. Yeah, I Thank mean, you. yeah, I mean, the one release valve, the one, the one of the few data points that, that that China has the hardest time controlling is the yuan that's not controlled by the. So if if China's CBDC is is effective and successful, then it will be a vehicle through which to attain more medium of exchange for the Chinese currency as a factor of time. And you will see this play out because other countries will start to hold more foreign reserves in Chinese yuan if they're successful with being the pioneers at this next front. The most obvious and in your face and least controllable market in the world where you'll see this reflected is FX. Thank you. Yeah, that's really what I was looking for. And and you guys are both right. I mean, you don't know what situation we're going to be when this gets rolled out. I mean, it's, it's you know, it's like saying what's going to happen in the next Fed Fed meeting in the Nasdaq. But where's the Nasdaq going to be? I mean, it, there's just a lot of things that could be happening. I, to, I totally get that, and I appreciate um, both of your answers. And I want to move on and talk about interest rates a little bit because we both we've all talked about it, how it's impacting gold. We see the 30 year continue to look uh, uh, to the downside. At what point? I mean, do you guys think that rates 
I mean, how much further can they go before this, the Fed steps in and set, and has to do something, yield curve control? I mean, I look at the chart of the, of the bonds, and I know that that's not necessarily all the bond guys are going to go, oh, here, Anthony's looking at a chart of the bonds. It's, but uh, that's not how it's going to determine rates. But when you look at it, to me, it's like, <laughs> man, how far could this thing go? I mean, you know, I'm a technician at heart, so I, I do go to that. But I just feel like it could go a ways. Um, and, and rates could keep going up on the long end. And at, at what point do you think that the Fed ha is going to step in? Or do you not think they're, they're going to? And we'll, we'll go back to you, Trace, to start. I think this is a better question for Danielle. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, um, this is not really my realm. Uh, so I will hand it to Danielle. For this All right, one. Danielle. <laughs> uh, I have to be so... Anthony, my answer is I have no flipping idea. It depends on yep. what the transmission mechanism is into the NASDAQ, into the stock market. There is a, you know, prior to the, prior to quantitative easing, prior to 2008, 2009 era, the correlation between CEO confidence and the S&P 500 was kind of shaky at best. And now it's up to 0.7%. So if stocks come down enough, then CEOs are going to start cutting heads and you're going to see, you're going to see fallout in the real economy. So because, because CEO decisions are transmitted through the stock market and because the NASDAQ is now understood to trade one for one with the with, with long maturity treasuries, the higher they go, the more the NASDAQ breaks down, the lower yields go, the more NASDAQ's, the, the, the NASDAQ is, is, is shielded. So the Fed can say that, that they're going to let inflation run as hot as possible, that they're going to look right through it. If anything in the markets breaks, their narrative goes into the trash can. And that much I can tell you is a former central banker. So if you get a, a, a true correction in the stock market because you see yields persistently rise and go maybe past that 1.8, 1.93, 2% threshold and the wheels fall off the stock market, it's all bets are off. Yield, cold, yield curve control will roll right out. And they've been jawboning yields down at every chance they get at the podium since blackout ended and Powell spoke after the FOMC. And they've been doing a damn good job because yields have been coming down ever since. So, but again, if you want to know when the Fed's going to move or what the threshold is on, on the 10 year yield, it's, it, it all has to do with what's reflected in the stock market. And it really is as simple as that. That's exactly what I feel like too, because when you look at it, you go, they're watching equities because at right. some point, if all of a sudden the NASDAQ is getting buried because rates are going up, to me, I, that's absolutely the trigger. I just was wondering if you thought there was a certain amount to where, you know, you go back to the debt and 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 how all these other things are going on. And that's not my <laughs> that's not my world. So you're saying it really it just comes down to the equity market. Look, it, 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 we've seen money supply explode. You're talking about massive fiscal spending here and people going, well, where's where's the inflation? As long as you see money supply explode in velocity, say, I don't care, meh, it doesn't matter. The money has yeah. to move once it's created. If the money doesn't move when it's created, you're not gonna move the Fed. Trace, I don't know if you wanna say a comment on this at all. No, no, I, I agree. I mean, I think it's all boils down to the stock market. If the stock market you know, starts to tank, Forget it. The Fed's going to definitely the Fed is going to make a make a decision. I mean, they already have a vehicle set up with BlackRock to purchase equities outright if they have to. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing that we're at this point, isn't it? You know, that we're really it's it's the interest rates that we're looking at. And for, for the Fed to do policy, it's going to come down to what happens in the Nasdaq. It's pretty. With, Pretty, with stocks yeah. at all time highs, just about. I mean, if you're looking at a long term, long term yeah. chart, this entire discussion is asinine. <laughs> because stock is still so close to all all time highs, and that's how that's how petrified the the, the Fed is. Yeah. Other than a training wheel falling off this market. Right. Exactly. I mean, it's it, it really is. It, it, it's it's like, and even when you look at how much interest rates have moved, it's nothing. I mean, yeah, it's big in in the context of where we were to where we are now. I mean, yes, but in in the bigger picture, the big scheme of things, it's not that big of a deal to have interest rates where they are right now and but yet it's the talk and it's it's why gold can't rally and it's why you know all these things are happening and i, and I totally get it but it's like you know but it, that's why i like to discuss these things and just hear 
um, other people and what they're thinking about it as well. Because I just keep going back to where I look at it and go, this is all that matters is the stock market. And, you know, that's a lot of Twitter talk, you know, people talking about that. And, you know, for me, the, the trader side, I mean, that's just what I see. And, it, and it's, I guess that's just what it is. I want to move on and talk about, I want to talk about the dollar a little bit because the dollar's dead, right? Um, and I, I just, I, I look at this market every single day. I really don't have much of an opinion on it. I don't trade it, but it has so much impact on everything we do and everything we talked about today. Trace, we will start with you on this one because I know that you like to, to look and trade I do the, like, the dollar. I like punishment. I like well, it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what are your thoughts on on the dollar? Um, well, actually we are seeing, you know, we are seeing it kind of bounce some. And actually, if you uh, look at the recent uh, COT report, right? Um, uh, leverage funds actually just are now, you know, everybody was short the dollar. Everybody was short the dollar. Now you're finally starting to see uh, flow, which, uh, switch long the dollar. So really, I don't think they're going to let the dollar sky right now. But, you know, Yellen wants a stronger dollar, right? So, um, and she keeps saying that. So I think that, you know, we may see, you know, I don't know, 93, 95 range perhaps, and just kind of stay there for a while. Um, if you kind of look left, that's where we kind of were, uh, you know, that's kind of where we were ranging for a very long time before. Um, so the dollar might rise, but I don't think they're gonna, you know, they want uh, the dollar to explode. And if we see, you know, we start Starting to see people get long that that start, that takes pressure off, say, getting a short squeeze, right? When you have everybody short and you pop, um, so it's kind of also oh, kind of my view on the dollar. I think it's gonna, you know, maybe be a slow grind, um, and, but they won't let it get too high. What I, what I think will be interesting is, I mean, you see in the dollar today, I'm just looking at the futures, just a little bit above 92, really struggling to get above that area. It's hit it a bunch of times. I know a lot of people are looking at 92-ish right. uh, as a technical level. And, uh, you know, what I'm interested in with the dollar is, you know, if it does start to actually come up here and actually just start to slowly grind up a little bit or even just stay in a range above this 92 the impact it's going to have on other markets we talked about today, you know, dollars has been a market that I think all traders are watching. And the higher it inches up, the more uh, I think you have to keep an eye on what is going to be very sensitive to be moving when the dollar is moving up. Danielle, what are your thoughts on the dollar? So I, I think um, I'm, I'm going to put my I'm, I'm never political, but I'm just going to put my my congressional calendar hat on for a second okay. and say that, that, that the next slug of legislation, that it was not coincidental at all that the unemployment benefits that were re-extended, that were re-extended, that were re-extended, those emergency ones end on September 30th, which happens to be the last day of the fiscal year in the United States. So any kind of existential threat to the dollar because there's three or four trillion more in fiscal spending coming down the pipeline, which, which puts negative pressure on the dollar after all these technicals are finally resolved, by the way. Tracy did a good job of walking through the technicals and how overstretched that short dollar position was. But once we get closer to the end of the fiscal year and it, it looking like we've got another three, four trillion coming down the pipeline, then you'll start to see, I think, jitteriness and nervousness about dollar weakness again. But we're nowhere near September just yet. I want to talk a little bit about crypto and um, for me, you know, it's interesting. I have been buying gold and I've actually been buying crypto as well because uh, on the way, I would say, well, on the way down when I saw the way that gold was acting versus Bitcoin and I really traded more Ethereum, but nonetheless, I've been buying it because I keep going back to, and I know Tracy, you, you kind of mentioned that you said you don't know if people are using, if crypto is the new hedge against central banks or not, but um, I just noticed that that is really kind of what it is. I know there's a lot of speculation in crypto as well. That goes without saying. I mean, but uh, I just believe that it has taken some from gold. And I just want to know what you guys think about crypto. I mean, just it, obviously the majors, Bitcoin and Ethereum. You know, I, I'm full disclosure. I, I, own, I own a good amount of Ethereum. I've got some Bitcoin cash. And I'm going to continue to buy this stuff on dips because everything that I see... Um, with these markets, just seeing more and more people talking about them. We talked about a central bank digital currency. I mean, you know, these 
these stupid NFTs. And I, I, I don't even want to talk about that with, with you guys because I think it's just the most ridiculous thing of all time. Um, but it, it just crypto is here to stay. I just don't think it's going anywhere. What are your thoughts? We'll go to you first, Trace. Um, what are your thoughts on Bitcoin and Ethereum, just the crypto space right now? I mean, I have some, but it's not something that I, I don't know how you trade that with the, the volatility that it is. Um, I, I have some, but I, I'm, I don't trade it. I'm just. But what do you think they are? I mean, how much of, how much are they being used now? I, th I think is really more of what, I, what I'm trying to get to here versus like a gold. I mean, I have mean, they I, really taken that role? I don't know. I mean, if you talk to um, like the diehard maximalists, you know, people, <laughs> oh, and you they know, are this is, you know, their personal freedom. They are their own central banker. They are, you know, in control of their uh, destiny, right? So, uh, you know, I think there's that kind of group of it. I think there's, you know, some people that are just trading it because it's, volatile and it's fun. Um, I think there's people that um, are holding on to it because, you know, maybe it's a thing, maybe it's not a thing, maybe, you know, I don't know. Um, so I think there's a, I mean, I think everybody's, you know, in it right now because it's exciting, um, because it, you're your own central banker, because, I mean, there's a lot of reasons. I think that, you know, if you ask people why, why they're in it right now, um, I think there's a myriad of reasons, really just like, you know, trading any, you know, trading any. Yeah, it's a sp speculative asset. I mean, I mean, right. I, I, I mean, look at, I, I've, I've been buying it and I continue to buy it because I, once again, I go back to why I started getting a little bit more aggressive with it. It was just because in this type of environment, I feel like it is a tool that's being used. It could be coincidence. I don't know, but it's something that I see. And I, I trust my eyes, you know, you and I, we both say, you know, trade what you see, not what you think. And that's one of the things I look at and go, it's just, it's, it's happening. And, you know, for how long, who knows? Uh, but Danielle, I look at you as more on the traditional side of things, right? Like I look at, you know, like your background and you're somebody who um, I go to, to really understand the depths of things that I have no idea about. And I'm curious what you think about what has been happening with Bitcoin, how much it's gone up and just your thoughts on the crypto space in general. So, you know, I, I, uh, on a philosophical level, I needed to get to the bottom of what, what, what the driving catalyst was to bring this about. So I, I started looking at every single asset class and a buddy of mine pointed out to me, look at negative yielding sovereign debt and look at the two of these guys. If you look at negative yielding sovereign debt, Bitcoin didn't even exist prior to it. But the deeper we got into this, and especially as negative yielding debt started to explode around 2017 or so, the higher Bitcoin went. And we've seen such a tight, tight, tight relationship. It is the anti-negative interest rate vehicle. And I'm, I'm, I'm just, just for fun, track the two on your Bloomberg next time you're just, you, you've got insomnia. And one exists because of the other. You start to take logic and reasoning out by, by pushing entire yield curves into negative ter territory, which is what happened with Germany. And you see a one-on-one -on -one relationship with Bitcoin. Now, you call me a traditionalist, and in that sense, if you go back to 400 years of history, we've never had a reserve currency fall and be happy-go-lucky replaced by this Bitcoin or any type of substitute willingly. So I'm not personally of the opinion that the Chinese want to necessarily give up their next their, 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 their space in line and, and not have the yuan take over as a reserve currency, but whatever. I'm a traditionalist, and I don't think that that's going to be feasible. In the meantime, for anybody who's got, you know, who, who can take enough Dramamine and who's got the stomach for it and who can <laughs> trade it, trade away. Have fun, but understand that it's a reflection of really just disgust in what's being done to fiat currencies worldwide. I've heard that take before. Um, I mean, look at our our friend Raul Paul, um, and, and look what well, look what he's how much he's gotten into the crypto side of things. I mean. I remember he put a tweet out how many months ago was it, Trace? I don't know where he said, I'm out of everything. I'm all Bitcoin now, or whatever it was. Yep. I'm paraphrasing, right? It was just something like, you know, and someone like him says that. It's like, you know, <laughs> you, you got to obviously take note 
uh, and you know, Mark Yusko, all guys I've, I've spoken with, you know, people on the show, these guys are, you know, all in. And I just look at, I just look at how many people now, I mean, the radio, I'm listening, I was listening to Sirius on the way in today and they're talking about NFTs and I'm just like, what, what is going on? And I know you have to use Ethereum for it. And I, I just keep going back to all these different reasons and all these different people that don't, that have not touched it yet. And that's really more of the reason why I've been stepping in um, to, to it. And it, once again, it's, it's a tradable asset. I don't know what I'm going to do with it besides turn it back into dollars when I win or lose on it. Right. Because that's what you're going to end up doing anyway. That's what I think funny about it, at least for someone like me is I'm only going to turn it back into dollars when I'm done. I'm not using the crypto for anything else. Like some other people are, but it's an interesting space. And I just, you know, it's good just to hear what you guys think, uh, and, and thought about it. And final thing I want to talk about today before I let you guys go is really is real estate. Um, I think, it's hard not to talk about real estate when you're in a time where we're all talking about inflation. I live in South Florida. I know real estate's a very local thing. And I, and, and um, you will, you're in Canada, Trace, and uh, Danielle, you're in Texas, right? Oh yeah. So it's all of these places, yeah. it's all, all, those three places are just, it's unbelievable. I mean, my wife's in real estate and it's she puts stuff up on the market and it, it's like she's getting three offers before people even see it and it's unbelievable to me um we'll stay with you danielle and we'll, we'll finish with tracy today but what are your thoughts on real estate well so it is a white hot market right now builders are actually having to uh pull back in about half the communities nationwide and restrict supply coming online they don't want to get ahead of themselves because land prices people talk about lumber all the time good god look at land prices so getting your hands yeah. on lots is very difficult right now. The existing home market has been almost completely exhausted. You can't keep anything on the market. There is a, there, there, the speculative rush into housing, I think, is not something that's going to be arrested in the near term. But the behavior and the underlying frenzy, I've seen this book before. I know how it ends. I don't need a refresher course. And that's why I would certainly suggest to first-time home buyers, especially, uh, that, in, 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 that for if, if there's the ability there to keep renting, you got to let this white hotness come and go because this is not how markets are meant to operate where you have more licensed real estate agents in this country than you do properties that are listed. And that's where we are right now is a very upside down market. So the heat will continue, but th this type of white heat naturally burns itself off. It's amazing how much FOMO carries into every single thing that we you know, it's it just, well, it's unbelievable. That owns right? a third of the market for God's sake. I mean, <laughs> it, please. It, it, it's like, you know, Florida starts to get busy. It gets hot. All of a sudden your friend, his friend, her friend is wants to buy a place in Florida. How many times have I seen this in my life? A couple, one, obviously really big time back to you, Trace. I mean, is this a bubble again? Is it not? Is it sustainable? Is it different this time? Thoughts on real estate? I, you know, I think I, I agree with Danielle. I mean, I think that it's will continue, but you know, as we've seen before, um, you know, the, you know, the housing market, you know, has its ups and downs. So, um, you know, again, I wouldn't, you know, I have to agree with her. If you're a first time home buyer, I think you can can wait a little bit, but it's you know, crazy to see um, people, you know, rush into real estate so much. And perhaps that's a, a reflection of um, uncertainty, right? We don't know what this COVID's going on. We don't know. People are rush rushing into some hard assets. Yeah. I mean, it feels like everything comes back to the NASDAQ because imagine a little downtick in the NASDAQ, how people would feel about buying real estate. Because I do feel that a lot of people do feel a little bit wealthier now. You know, everybody's uh, stocks continue to go up and you know, obviously we talked about even how, well, we think rates are, rates will only go up as far as they hurt the NASDAQ. And it just, I think it's just amazing how much, uh, at least it, it, from what I'm reading the tea leaves here, it, everything really does come down to the equity market again. I mean, how, how if it gets hurt, boy, does that, it just changes so many things, you know, I mean, it, it's, and after what we just saw, how many crashes could we see? Uh, in our lifetime. I remember when I first started to trade, I started trading in 98, 99. Then you had 2000 to 2001. Then it was a years of grind up. And you always think it's going to be so uh, long again before you see these crashes, obviously 08. And then we saw what happened this year with COVID. But it feels like we're in a time where these things can happen so fast. 
and they're just and they're almost over as fast as they start because of what happens with the Fed. But it just uh, equity volatility is. I mean, it's going to just be, it's just here right now. Um, just too much is. Unless you let markets correct, the volatility is going to be a lot more frequent. And that's simply the fact it, of life. Exactly. I mean, so well said, Danielle. That's that's exactly what it is because they're not ever really truly correcting now. Right. And I don't think we talk about that as much because it's like, you know, I'm a traditionalist and where I learned how to trade and I'm a very simple guy and I talk about the way that I approach the markets. And it just is like, I feel like, Looking at the markets now, it, it, talking about the NASDAQ specifically, this thing could be down 20%, 30%, no problem. It could be right back up with what the Fed does, and these moves are happening so fast. And my mind didn't really think that way for the first probably 15 years of my career. Now I feel like that thing could happen. Boy, this correction could just be like that. Boom, boom, and it's... Uh, and. Well, and you uh, saw what happened last year, right? I mean... Yeah, that's what I mean. I mean, a couple of weeks, and Fed was right in there with... Guns loaded and more <laughs> yeah right didn't they do um danielle correct me if i'm wrong didn't they do more in that short period of time than they did with all of the qe one two and three? Oh gosh that, yes and qe right. one two and three didn't involve municipal bonds and junk bonds by the way so yes they yeah. definitely did more yeah so it just leads us to you know once again <laughs> we'll see there's there's so much that could happen here going forward and just the ripple effect into all these different markets. It's, it's, uh, that's why we got to continue to do our homework and follow uh, people like you guys. I'm so thankful to have you guys on the show together. Like I said, two, uh, fans of both of yours got to know you pretty well over the years. Uh, um, I want to thank you both for joining me today. And before I let you go, uh, we got Danielle here where we got the quill intelligence behind you. Tell everybody where they can learn more about you and subscribe to your, uh, Sure. Um, to your Look, services. Come on, it is the it is the easiest money you will ever spend. It is entertaining. And if you like what I say, you will absolutely love what I write. So hop on quillintelligence.com. And if you don't follow me on Twitter, do so because it's it's the Twitter, it's it's the Demartino Booth and Shy Girl show. So it's it's always fun. <laughs> uh, so come follow. I I can't even say with, with her on the screen, come follow us. So yeah. Yes. <laughs> shy, same with you. Twitter, everyone knows you're shy girl, but um Talk about what you're doing with uh, with your writing. Right, and so um, I'm at Hedge Fund Telemetry right now, um, doing energy and materials uh, coverage strategist. So um, you can always go on that site and take a two week trial. See if you like my work. Um, I cover again energy and materials, and then yeah. I'm always on Twitter. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you guys are two of the best in this business. I appreciate you guys and your insight. It's the the value is um, it's really unmatched in our industry. So, thank you both again for coming on the show. It's so great to see the both of you. Uh, thank you for coming on Futures Radio Show today. Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate your time. Thank you for listening to Futures Radio Show. If you enjoyed the show, please leave a review on iTunes. You can listen to all of our episodes on FuturesRadioShow.com, iTunes, YouTube, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher.